This is the Champions Rugby Show. I'm Martin Hindley, and it's not every day you get to speak to a match winner in a European Cup final. He scored two tries in Leicester Tigers' first Heineken Cup victory in 2001, and that one was pretty crucial. He went on to make more than 260 appearances for the Tigers and became an integral part of one of their best ever sides. And he's now gone from the boot room to the boardroom. More on that a little bit later. Joining me today, an absolute privilege to speak to Leon Lloyd. Thanks for joining us on the Champions Rugby Show. Leon, uh, how are you doing these days? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm excited about uh, talking about it. I noticed that uh, you've tweeted about your, your 26 press-ups in 26 seconds challenge. I hope it's not too raw right now. I believe you finished second best, so it'll be pretty good to speak to you about being a, being a winner today. I mean, how are, you, uh, how are you faring and keeping busy during the lockdown? Yeah, it's good, actually. It's, it's given me some headspace. I've been able to do a bit of cycling using my one hour a day, effectively, and get some training done. And it helped. To, I think structure has been really good. So getting some fitness in, doing some work, breaking up the day with the family, it's a bit of homeschooling, it's all good. We're going to get into your, your Heineken Cup story uh, shortly, but uh, how did you get into rugby? I mean, is it true that you were a bit of a round ball fan as a, as a school kid? And, and how did all of, all of that change for you? Yeah, absolutely. I was a, a football fan and I say this a lot. You know, my dream growing up in, in a city Coventry, my dream was to play for Coventry City and you know, they won the FA Cup in 87. Big Seal Regis was uh, someone I looked up to. So I played Saturday football, Sunday league football, and rugby really wasn't on my radar at all until I went to senior school. Uh, and then weirdly, but they didn't play football at school. I, I was forced to play rugby. So it's one of those things where I was a, a pretty quick runner and I didn't mind getting myself into a bit of trouble back then as well. So I was involved in the odd altercation, let's say, from, uh, from time to time. And I think my PE teacher, Mr. Parker, put two and two together and forced me to play rugby. And that's sort of where my rugby journey started at the age of 13. There's a few things that we've all done during lockdowns that we might not have ordinarily done in real life. I actually watched that 87 Cup final against Tottenham a couple of days ago. There was uh, there was something on the Coventry site and uh, and it was very entertaining as well, taking you back to sort of the Houchins and the and the gins and all it. of that kind of stuff. Uh, very, 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 it was very amazing. entertaining. Yeah, it was amazing. Well, it was amazing for me being a, a Sky Blues fan and looking back then how the games changed, but it was, it was, uh, I found myself at night by myself watching it. It was, it was good to watch back. Well, let's take you all the way back to making your debut just under a decade after that for, for the Leicester Tigers at the time at which the Heineken Cup was was coming into being. I mean, as a young man, could you quite understand what was happening to the game as it was turning professional? And, and then all of a sudden, just like the round ball, rugby had a European Cup. I mean, what was that like? I, th- I think it was a really quick catapult into the, the, the team for me, really. As I say, I, started, I picked up my first rugby ball at the age of 13. Uh, then I signed for Leicester at 16. And then made my debut for Leicester at 17. So in that short space of time, I'd gone from not really, I'd actually say I've gone from actually hating the thought of playing rugby, not knowing anything about it, but then hating the thought of it because it, I just didn't understand it, to actually it being my my job. It wasn't a job at the beginning. Remember, it wasn't professional. So it, it, it went really quickly for me. And um, although I still have a, a love of football, rugby became something that I grew to love and became a, a huge part of my life. Let's take you back to the first season then in the in the Heineken Cup for English clubs or the second season uh, of the tournament. And it sounds a much, much bigger thing these days, but you played on the wing in your debut against Leinster in the Heineken Cup at Lansdowne Road. I mean, Leinster, a very different beast these days to back then, but what an occasion that must have been for you. I mean, what are your memories from back then in 96, 97? Yeah, you're right. I don't know if it would have been. It was a massive, massive fixture back then as well. I know it's Leinster have gone on to win the, you know, the, the cup a number of times. But back then they were a huge team to go away. I hadn't been on a plane that many times to go on a plane and fly across and play in Ireland on a Friday night game. Uh, for me, was huge. I suppose added to that was the fact that I got selected ahead of Roy Underwood, so I had the, the additional pressure of it being a huge game for the club. But then Bob Dwyer had selected me ahead of Roy Underwood, so I had to deal with that in the first instance. And then I was playing against uh, Dennis Hickey, who was the Irish winger at the time. It was just a... He wasn't a that bad, was he? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. And I, I tell you, the funny thing about that match was it was at Lansdowne Road as well. Still one of my favourite grounds, but a very young Jordan Murphy, who I didn't know at the time. I'd missed school. I'll probably get him in trouble here, but he'd missed school to go and watch that match. 
uh, left the British Leinster and then, you know, I suppose, looking back now where he is now and how our journeys came together, it's, it's, it's fascinating me, Tommy, that, that it, made, it made me feel really old. How did you deal with the whole uh, situation with, with Rory Underwood? I mean, what was your relationship like with him and, and, and how did you tackle that pressure, if you like, uh, of playing in such a significant position, in such a significant game and replacing such a legend, if you like? It was quite tough because I didn't grow up having rugby idols because I didn't watch rugby. As I said before, I mentioned Big Seal Regis. So for me, I didn't really have any. I looked to people who I was similar to. So I, when I watched rugby on TV, I saw Jerry Guskett and I thought, wow, he's he looks pretty decent. I'd like to be like him. And then when I when I signed for Leicester and I was, I was on the wing and I saw Rory Underwood and saw what he did achieved for England and also Tony Underwood was there also at the club as well. Then I was sort of in awe of those guys and I would watch them and I wanted to be like those. Um, and the season that I made my debut was when it was sort of the game to and pro and I said Bob Dwyer was there. That was the season that we opened up, Walford Road opened up the Underwood suite for the two brothers. So you can imagine the prestige and the, the pedestal that those guys were put on by the players and by the supporters. So it was, I suppose it would be strange for the supporters to see Rory Underwood being left out for this unknown kid from Coventry. So that was quite difficult because straight away I was under pressure to justify my, my shirt, my choice. You are anywhere when you get picked at any club, not just Leicester, I'm sure. Every club you play at, you know, you've got to prove that you're worthy of the shirt. But when that shirt belonged to someone like Rory Underwood, who who was a hero of mine, and also a hero of Welford Road, the supporters, and they've just named a restaurant after him. I think that added an extra bit of an extra bit of pressure on my shoulders. But the arrogance of youth, I just just got on with it. You know, I just got on with it, and I had a job to do at the weekend. And Rory was good with me, and it was never about me and me versus Rory. It was about Leicester Leicester beating the team at the weekend. So my memories of that were always. Um, of good ones and I never felt awkward or, or in a different position You seemed to go from strength to strength that season in 96-97 you played in the quarter-final win against Harlequins and then the semi-final victory over the holders the, the first European Cup winners to lose um, but you wasn't picked for the final when Leicester Tigers took on Breve how did that come about how did you find out and how did you feel in the, the build-up to that match it must have been quite quite bittersweet Mixed emotions, really, if I'm honest, um, because at the time I lived in a house with a, a young Irish back row player called Eric Miller. He went on to, to play a lot of times for Ireland in the British Lions, famous Lions series. And we'd played in a, in a very, the Leicester team was changing quite a lot then in the professional era. And um, I, I remember playing in the, the big games leading up to that. And then we got to the final and Bob Dwyer decided to, to drop uh, myself and Eric, who we lived together for Dean Richards and Rory Underwood. Uh, and if you think about it, of two people in Leicester history, let alone in English history, uh, English rugby history, to be dropped for, you can see why he may have done it. Because we were two young lads, and he, I remember he said he came up to me beforehand and said he's going through experience over form. And at the time, I remember thinking, I was only a youngster. It was at the Arms Cardiff Arms Park. It was the last game at the Cardiff Arms Park uh, before they were going to demolish it. And we were favourites to win that the way we'd played before, beating Toulouse in the in the semi, as you've mentioned. And I sort of thought. The game was built up to be absolutely the biggest game in the club's history. And I was only young and I thought, oh, maybe, maybe it's the right decision by the coach to leave me out and to go for Rory Underwood because he's played in these big games before and, and same for Eric. And afterwards, when the game, when they built up the game, we were sort of sat on the bench and you wanted to get out there and play. And we got, we got an absolute hide in that day by Breve. They were brilliant, absolutely destroyed us. And it sort of made me think, you know what, I don't want to be in this situation again. If I'm, I, I felt like I was good enough to play, but I just it's like anything. You, sort of, you win some, you lose some selection in sport. It's about bouncing back. So fast forward a few years later and then you get your chance again. I suppose it meant more, even more to me because I got a chance when I'd been left out for a, a match which I probably thought I should have been uh, playing in. And the referee's whistle has gone for the end of the match and it's been a thoroughly exciting match. But Breeze eventually running out, deserved winner by 28 points to nine. It has been a tremendous second half performance by Breeze. They started strongly, they finished strongly. You mentioned about the, the way that Breeze played. It was the style with which they, they won the game as well as the strength that they had. You think about people like Christophe Lamaison outside centre, Carbonneau and, and Alain Penault, the captain in the halves. Were there lessons that you took as a club from that day that helped Leicester Tigers to achieve what they went on to achieve with, with that phenomenal side? Absolutely. Don't believe the hype. Uh, I'd say we were we were tipped to win that game uh, convincingly and um, it was a complete opposite. Gregory Cacklow, I remember playing. We, if you remember, we went and got some big back row players after that, some bigger back row players. 
uh, he sort of destroyed us a little bit. They had a really fast winger called Sebastian Carat, who was unstoppable. So I think it was a, a as a learning curve, but a part of the journey uh, for my career. That was a really pivotal point because we had a really good season. We went in there thinking that uh, we were strong, beating the current holders, and then had a lesson dealt to us. So I think we learned from that never to to rest on our laurels going forward. And we always refer back to that all the way through my career. We referred back to that final against Breve. Uh, every final, I was very fortunate to play in quite a lot of finals, uh, and that Breve one was always in my memory. Uh, and also my teammates' memory because it was very painful for a lot of us. So I think that stood us in good stead for the success that we had. If we'd have won that game, then who knows what would have happened. I don't I don't think Leicester probably wouldn't have been as successful as what we were. I think that loss and the way it happened probably paved the way for the success that, that followed. What role did Bath winning the tournament in the way that they did the year after, and especially Northampton winning it for the rivalry between Leicester and Northampton in 2000 at Twickenham against Munster, what role did those two wins play in creating the desire at Leicester to be European champions? I think that made it even worse. I think Bath beat Breve, didn't they? they it did, 1918, yeah. that's right. It did, yeah, and away in France as well. So I think for us, you always want to be the first to do something. Don't you want to win, of course, but to be the first, then the history between Leicester and Bath, as you know, is, was, was huge and still is, and even more so between the, the Saints as well, just down the road. So for those teams to go on and and do well, it, it made us reflect more on the breed match and put things in place. So I think that's why, I think when, when we did go on to win it in 2001, other teams had won it before, so we weren't the first to do that. But I remember finishing that match and we talked as a, as a squad of players that, great, we've won it once, but anyone can win the lottery. And no one's won it, and an English team has won it back-to-back. So if we, before we even celebrated that first one, we were already thinking about what can we do that, to better uh, the other, teams that had, other English teams that had won it once before. So I think that was the mindset and the mentality of the squad that we had at that time about better never stops. There's some players in that squad. I mean, obviously yourself, Austin Healy, Martin Johnson, Ben Kay, Martin Corey, Andy Good. Um, but what you're telling me here is it's not just the rugby skills. It's a psychology that made such a big difference when you came into and out of that 2000, 2001 season. Is is that fair to say? Well, yeah, definitely. I think the the mindset, the, the togetherness, the team spirit, we were, we were a definite squad. There were players who didn't play in that 01 final who went on to achieve unbelievable things. Like even Lewis Moody was on the bench, he didn't get on. You know, there were people, Freddie Tualangi, who featured late in the, the next final. There were people who were there, there who were in the fringes who missed out, but we were definitely a, a squad. It was never, you're never anyone from Leicester talking about that team that won in Paris. It's always the squad that won. And that goes down to the, the managers. We had you know, Dino and John Wells and our, our team manager, Joe Hollis. Everyone was all part of that group. I think that's why it was so special. And the, the photographs that you see afterwards, it's of the squad and all of us together because everyone played a part. And I know everyone talks about it. It's a bit cliche. Talk about, you know, no one's speaking on the team, but we really had a, a feel that that was a special squad at that time. We're coming up to 20 years of, of an anniversary in next year of, of that success. I get the sense that you were a group of, of friends, not just a team. Is that fair or is that sort of history, history sort of painting things with, with rose tinted glasses? I mean, how, how do you all, how did you all get on as a group then? And how do you get on as a group now? I think like, like all team sports, you have mates and you have teammates. And I think it would be naive to think that everyone is going to get on all the time because you don't, because it's a, it's a very intense and target driven environment. And it's, it's tough when you're in, there's only so many shirts available and sometimes you win that selection, sometimes you don't, but to remain friends and support the person that's got your shirt. I think that's one thing we had, which was really good. I don't, I've not seen an environment since where I've been left. I've, so I've been, I got left out of a, a final before, and my job was to go and support the person who had been picked ahead of me. Yes, the devastation of not being picked and all those things that come with that feeling. But my first initial thought was, right, it's not about me. I've got to go and support the person that's got my shirt. And that's, I don't know if that happens elsewhere. I'm not too sure. I'd be very surprised if it does. But for me, that's what, you know, I was no different to other people. Other people got left out. Only, as I said, there's only so many shirts. But there's a core group of people in that, that squad who have remained close. You know, we, we con- we're in contact with each other. We do a lot of stuff together. We, ha- we will be having a 20-year reunion of that match on the 19th of May in 2021. So it's, it's etched in my brain. And, w- and when we talk about it, we don't, it may, it may sound like we sort of, reminisce and reflect on that one point in history but that squad of people that was one match we'd already been successful before then because we'd won the league the years before that as well two years before that consecutively but that was I suppose the icing on the cake and that's the core squad of players have remained in contact regardless of where they are around the world and even though Joel Stransky 
wasn't involved then. He was still part of that squad that got us there. So the likes of Joel and Pat Howard and you know, those guys, Dave Lockheed, the Canadian who um, who left the year before, then Winston Stanley came in from Canada. Those people who were either didn't feature in that match or that period are still part of that core squad. And I think that's testament to how Dino um, brought the squad together. You said that you were going over to play the Friday night game uh, at Lansdowne Road as a, as a teenager. And let's remember when you went, you boarded that flight and went over to, to France um, for the Parc des Princes match against Stade Francais. You were experienced, but you were still a very, very young man. How did you handle the build-up to, to a Heineken Cup final against a, a star-studded lineup like Stade Francais? Well, thankfully, I had the, I got the Leicester team as a youngster where they didn't really change the team much. You know, if Martin Johnson was injured or Dean Richards was injured or Neil Back was injured, they'd still play because that's the way Leicester was. They didn't change the team. So I got in then and played with all those senior guys who were far senior than I was. So I had had that experience from Breve from 96. So when we got to 2000, 2001 and the younger players who were, who were my age, the likes of Jordan Murphy, Lewis Moody, Paul Gustard, you know, those guys who were in and around the squad, I already I felt like I was the the senior player, even though I wasn't. You know, I was still one of the younger players, but I felt like because I've experienced that that big occasion before, and I don't think I'd played for England at that point. I think I was still so I wasn't an international player, but I still felt like I was sort of used to it. I was sort of, I was supposed to be there, but that was a very different match that final because we played across the road from their home ground at, at a neutral in inverted commas venue, which is a hundred yards from their home ground, and the Parc de Prant is such a special place anyway. It's sort of underground as you walk in. We went and did a training session there when the stadium was empty, but the atmosphere when the stadium was empty was just phenomenal. We just sat in the stand and looked down at the pitch and you could tell what the next day was going to be like. And I think that was special for a lot of the players, certainly the younger guys like myself and Lewis and Julius. And Andy Good as well, who's younger than me, he was, you know, that would have been his first real big test as well. But uh, I think it was, yeah, it, it was it was special, but I don't think anything could have prepared us for it. Although I say I can, I can look back at the brief game, but I remember in the, in the tunnel as he walked out, the atmosphere... And the, the fights that were kicking off before we even got onto the pitch, which you know the sixty seventy thousand people in the stadium would, won't be aware of, just because it just goes to show the two squads were both brimming and ready to uh, to go out to battle. So nothing can we pay for that, I don't think. Diego Dominguez trying to kick you to death, nine penalties, and a, and the dying art these days of a of a drop goal as well. What was the game plan to keep pace with with Stade Francais when they were just chiseling away and keeping the scoreboard turning over so regularly? How amazing was he? Like nine penalties. That was just unbelievable. But I think I think only only looking back on reflection, I did realise how many penalties that our forwards give away. And I can say that because I'm nowhere near them, so they can't say anything to me. <laughs> we, we get we gave a lot of penalties away, um, but we had a really strong defence. So we were confident that they weren't going to score a try past us, even though they did have a star studded team. You mentioned uh, Dominguez and Dominici and all the boys they had. Our defence was solid. I don't think they looked like scoring a try once. But if we give away a penalty anywhere in our half, even just in their own half, Dominguez punished us. He had a phenomenal game. And I sort of, I look back now, and although I wouldn't want to swap places with him, he has to be gutted. Kicking all those points in the final and not winning, and Stefan saying not winning there, he, he must reflect on that game uh, and see it through a very different lens than what than what we look at it. But it could have been so different. As I say, it could have been we were minutes away from him being a, a hero in Paris. You scored two tries in that final, Leon, but in your words, talk us through the, the winner. We did something that year and it's consistent really. I played, I started in the centre and I did that a lot and then I'd move out to the wing and we'd change it around. Like Tim Stimson started in the wing, moved to fullback, Jordan started in the fullback, moved to the wing and Austin Healy and Andy Good. Oz would start at nine, Good would start at ten. Then when the defences were getting tired then Oz would move to ten and Jamie Hamilton would come on. So that was just to just mix it up a little bit and I think the timing of that was, was brilliant because they were tired. We were up against it when we were from memory, we were up against it. The clock was ticking. We were in their half. And Oz going to 10, he was injured. He would tell you that he was really injured, but he wasn't that injured, but he tries to make out that he, he won the match for a single-handedly on one leg. But he he was injured and he, he spotted a gap, which, and I don't think uh, Goody would, would deny this, but he spotted a gap which Goody wouldn't have been able to take. So it's right place, right time. He went through the gap and it was just really for me to catch up with him. And then um thought he was going to dummy the ball because I know Austin very well. We were roommates for 10 years. And I should have got a medal for that, but she put up with him for 10 years. <laughs> so I know him very well, better than most. And when he broke through and he had a two-on-one with the fullback in the Heineken Cup final in injury time, knowing him as I do, I thought he's going to dummy this. He is going to dummy this to me and then score into the sticks himself. Uh, but then equally, I thought if he doesn't dummy it and throws it out and I'm not there, 
then how would I be able to look at myself in the mirror as well? So all these things are going through my mind. I'm looking at Vicky, he's not going to pass, he's not going to pass. And he broke through and he floated out an unbelievable pass, right, which stretched me out, which was right in front of me. A pass anywhere else, then, you know, then I may have got tackled by Dominici, uh, but right in front of me, stretched me out. Um, I luckily managed to catch it. And then just the rest was just easy, really, just dot down in the corner. There's a marvellous break by the scrum half Healy. Outside to Leon Lloyd. Lloyd has scored his second try. What a magnificent effort. Leicester couldn't have done better. What a magnificent break. That's what they wanted to happen. He sucked it all in. But it's a good finish as well by Leon Lloyd. That is a great, great play. Austin Healy, take a bow. Superb break, Austin Healy. That deserves to win the match for Leicester. And they deserve to win as well. So the people talk about that try, and I'm glad they do, because it's a special point in my career. But for me, the moment of that match, it wasn't Austin Healy breaking, it wasn't the other stuff before that. For me, the moment of that match that won Leicester Tigers the uh, Pining Cup for the first time was Tim Stimson's kick, because the kick was right on. I scored two tries in the same spot on the, in the corner, right on the touchline. And he missed the first one, but you don't think about that at the time because you think there's loads of time left. Then in injury time, you know, back in those days, you didn't have a, the clock didn't stop at 80. It sort of kept going and going and going and you're at the mercy of the referee and his stop clock. If Stimmer had missed that kick on the touchline where he'd already missed one previously in the exact same spot, then we had, it turned out we had two or three minutes left. No doubt in my mind, we'd have given away a penalty because that's what we did. Uh, uh, Dominguez would have kicked the penalty or even a drop goal and then we'd have lost because we would have only been two points, I think, in the lead. What Stimo's conversion did put us four points in the lead. And that just meant that they had to score a try past us. And I don't think you re- we realised at the time how significant that kick was. But to give a four-point cushion to meant that a drop goal or a penalty was not going to win in the match. It meant that they had to try and score. So for us and for me, looking back at it, Stimo was, uh, was my man of the match for that amazing kick that he got under that intense pressure. Leon Lloyd's second try, undoubtedly the hero of the hour. 42 the distance for Tim Stimson. A hush, a hoof, yes. and a roar. That's a very, very important kick. Very important kick. Oz was the uh, was the official man of the match at the end. You've touched on, let's say, the challenges of rooming with him, but what was he like to to have on your side? I mean, he's uh, obviously he's quite a reserved character. He doesn't speak much about that final these days. But um, what was it like to to have have such a, a craftsman in in the Leicester side? He was he was funny. He was funny, but he was very t- he's very very talented. He could play. If you look at where he's played for England, I think he's played every position in the English English back row apart from outside centre. I think I think he's played nine ten both wings, full-back and inside centre uh, test level, which is phenomenal. Yeah, he was, he was, a, he was good. He, he, was, he was very good. He was skilled. He didn't have, I think in, he would look back on his career and think if he stopped at one position, he may have had more caps. And I do feel for him a little bit that he didn't, wasn't part of that 3 squad. But not, I don't feel for him too much. But he missed out on that World Cup part, even though he was a part of that squad leading up to the World Cup and also following the World Cup as well. But as an individual and as a, uh, you know, the, the perception that people have of him from the outside, He's very different to what we'd have him in as a, as a player because if you weren't a team player, and I mentioned you before, the strength that we had about being the squad and no one was bigger than that. If you weren't one of those individuals, you wouldn't survive at Leicester. And that's evidenced by the players that joined the club and left the club and didn't stay, regardless of how good they were on paper or what their ability was on the pitch. If you didn't fit in with the culture, with what was at Leicester, then there was no place for you. So I think it was clear to us as players anyway, it may not have been as clear to the supporters and people on the outside of how, how do we put up with his his rubbish and his chat all the time because we, it was a case of having to put up with it but he knew he was a team player and he'll hate me for saying it but he was a team player and when it counted he was there for the boys uh, but then he also had the other side that he sort of played up to and controversial side which uh, he's, he's forward a career out of but yeah as a team player he was he was great but we had lots of them you know he wasn't we had a team full of individuals who ability wise we were special they had special ability Neil Back was one of the best players I've ever played with. His ability to push the standards up, the levels above all of us in training. Uh, I can list skills and strengths of the players and I'd leave Martin Johnson till last because he's, uh, we know what he went on to achieve. But we had lots of players who, who just did special things when they weren't asked of them and when, the, when people weren't watching and they just did it and it, it sort of created this knock-on effect for all of us to train harder, to push harder, to be better. And it, just, it was just a special time and a special club to be at. And there 
a wonderful scene for Leicester supporters as their team hoist that great European Cup high. And there, Dean Richard, no wonder he's thrilled. What a display he's given over the season because it's such a strain for the coaches. They do all the preparation and then they have to stand at the side and worry and hope that all their preparation comes to fruition. In any event, there you are, a wonderful scene. Leicester, the European champion. You mentioned Neil Back obviously had a significant role in, in winning the and defending successfully the, the Heineken Cup in 2002 in beating Munster, the hand of Back. Um, but that was a difficult season for you due to injury. How hard was that after the highs of Paris for you to cope with uh, with not being involved as much the, the following season? Yeah, it was tough. It, it, it was tough because my timing was always bad with injuries, unfortunately, and there's no good time to be injured. But I remember we, back then you had a playoff system where first played eighth and you had that second played seventh to get to the final. And we won the final that following year, but the first the eighth was Leicester versus Bristol. Uh, and we'd won the league weeks before the season finished. We were on fire that year. We played against Bristol, which I suppose you could say was a, a, a nothing game because first we eighth, the gap between the points, we should have you know, we should have smashed them. And in the first few minutes, it's one of those times as an outside back, I saw a rock happening and I, w- I approached it thinking, I'm going to smash the opposite number out of the way. Then I got close, I thought, oh, I hesitated. I thought, do I really need to go into that? Uh, and as I was on the wing that day, I sort of, as I decided, no, not for me that one. Lewis Moody comes alongside me and obviously he can't, he's not a mind reader. So he grabs hold of me and tries to, drill me in and so we both look over and because I decided mentally that I wasn't going to hit the rock I had my body relaxed and I sort of started to stand up again so what happened was I ended up hitting that rock in totally the wrong position and I ended up snapping the nerve in my neck I remember being stretched off to hospital from that match first the eighth hammering down with rain knowing that the cup final and the, the premiership final was weeks away and I couldn't lift my arm I thought I don't know I didn't know what happened I couldn't lift my arm and I still tried to get back for the final for the for the matches but unfortunately I just couldn't and I was out I was out for six months after that trying to build the nerve damage back with my neck but so it was it was tough for me not to be involved and I sort of sat on the bench and watched the boys no I didn't sit on the bench as a, as a substitute but I sat on the bench in my number ones and watched as a supporter it was tough for me I suppose the thing that helped was that I was injured it was different to the the brief final where I was fit and I was on the bench and I just wasn't selected this this one was slightly different in that I couldn't be selected anyway so it was easier to pill to swallow but the lads won, did a job back to back, as we said we'd do 12 months before that. Our aim was to win it back to back. So it was good to be a part of that. But even though I wasn't a part of it on the day, the, the boys did really well. You had an amazing rugby career as a player, but your life after rugby has been pretty incredible too. Tell us what you've been doing since retiring from the game and the many different uh, facets of, of your career now. I feel very lucky to have experienced, one, a rugby career with the people that I played with at a club like Leicester. I've just tried to do things that I'm passionate about and then I think the rest of it falls falls into place. I went back to university, I mentioned before, I left school at 16 to sign pro, I've gone back to university and done a degree and I've just finished my MBA, so I'm a very mature student, that's been quite tough. But my area, my area of study, is, and certainly in the more recent time, has been around helping athletes um, transition or prepare for transition and how do you replace that void in your life of experience, those amazing highs, the devastating lows of what, what um, elite sport could give you. And I'd do that from my own experience, really, because uh, I've been through that. And how do I replicate running out at Parc de France or at Twickenham or, or lifting a cup or, or all those things? It's very difficult to replicate that in the real world. So if I felt like that, then there are hundreds, th- hundreds and thousands of people around the world who will experience it at some point as well. So that's what I do. I spend my time helping the, the athletes prepare for transition and finding what they're passionate about outside of sport. Yeah, I feel quite lucky that I've, it didn't feel like work, where rugby was never a job for me. It was something where I turned up, had a laugh with the lads and got paid for it. And I certainly feel I've mean, got a job, which is very similar at the moment. It's worth mentioning your, your book, Life After Sport, From Boot Room to Boardroom. It's a, a very, very good read and, and one that is kind of lacking in the marketplace in terms of, uh, of that transition. There was one recently by a, a former cricketer a Lancashire and Derbyshire cricketer Luke Sutton which was going on to the sort of the mental health side of looking at that transition rather than the the working side uh, on both bases basically what's the best piece of advice that you would give to players coming to the end of their careers and and looking to replace those those highs with with something that can keep them healthy and mentally sound as well 
you know, I'd say first and foremost, enjoy it. If you enjoy it, it doesn't feel like work. So enjoy your career. Be be open and honest with yourself that it's not gonna last forever. We all think you're invincible and we're gonna play forever and then or we'll think about what we're gonna do next next year or next season or something else. But that hat comes around very, very quickly. I'd say definitely enjoy it, but I'd also say have some perspective. Do something outside of your sport. I went through a period for a couple of years of only focusing on rugby and my form dropped because I had nothing else and rugby was the be all and end all. It was Saturday to Saturday to Saturday. But at the time, I didn't realise the reason it was like that was because I was so focused and I had nothing else. Only when I did other things outside was I able to really enjoy the rugby side and the sports side. And, and that there are so many transfer. I suppose my, my bit, there's so many transferable skills that you develop in sport, but understand what they are whilst you're in the sport. Don't wait till you finish. Don't, you're going to retire one day. So put things in place to help you transition smoother and, and I suppose the last part of saying it is I would view transition as a positive thing. And that may sound weird when I've just said, you know, playing sport is the best job in the world and why would it be positive to leave it? But if you look at transition and what it is and you're transitioning towards something as opposed to transitioning away from something, that will totally change your mindset in that you'll be excited about the thing you go into. So be grateful for what you've had and achieved, but also be excited and use the same level of enthusiasm and commitment and attention to detail that you used in your sport in the next phase of your life because that career is going to be far longer than your sporting one. This series of, of podcasts is looking back uh, with the legends who have written the history of what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. The final question from me, Leon, is what does the tournament mean to you? What did it mean to you as a player? And what does it mean to you these days as, as you look on at, at what it's become? I'm not going to lie. People get asked me the question all the time, do you miss playing rugby? And my answer is, I don't even have to think about it. The answer is no, I don't miss playing rugby. And I may sound odd because of what we just talked about, about how it's the best job in the world, but my body is pretty broken and pretty sore now. I'm grateful for the experiences I had and the people I played with. What I do miss when I hear that the Heineken Cup, the music coming on for that weekend, that because it's played a, such a, a crucial part in my life. When I hear that music and the hair in the back of my neck go up, I could be in a different room and I hear the sound tune to it coming on. And regardless of who the fixture is, it takes me back to a specific point in time. And I don't think I'm any different to the other guys who have experienced the highs and lows of playing in that tournament. That's the pinnacle of club rugby. If you don't get a chance to play internationally, that's as close as you're going to get. And I think it's uh, that's the bit I miss. Those big weekends, those big you know, Champions Cup weekends um, where memories are made and history is made. So rugby was, was amazing, but the bit I miss the most are those big cup final weekends. Well, what we'll never be missing is your place in the history books of uh, what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. Uh, Leon Lloyd, thank you so much for taking us back through your, your recollections uh, of the tournament. And we wish you and your business the very best uh, in this post-COVID world that's, that's coming up. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Great to speak to a match-winning try scorer in a Heineken Cup final, Leon Lloyd. What recollections of that day at the Parc des Princes and being part of a sensational Leicester Tigers side. Another great Champions Rugby Show podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. We've got another legend of European club rugby, but not only that, of his national team jersey as well coming up shortly. You really won't want to miss this one. We hope you'll be joining us then from me and from all of the team. Goodbye.